Okay, so we should get started. Today we're happy to have uh, Greg Moore from Rutgers to tell us about flavored cones, uh, although the summer has finished. Uh, so take it away. Okay, thanks, Ibu. So yes, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. So the title of the talk is Chikati Fafa Flavored Cones. So here's an example. And uh, here's another example with n equals two. And later in the talk, we'll see some more examples. So part of this talk is a review of old things going back to the work of Chikati and Vafa from the early 1990s. Uh, much of it is review of two papers I wrote with Davide Gaiato and Edward Witten in 2015. And the new things are work with Asan Khan, which will appear in a paper, I hope, in October. So Asan will give a follow-up talk at the NHETC seminar on October 13th. So see uh, researchseminars.org for details. I think it'll be more or less the same material, but presented in a, in a different way. And Asan is a graduate student at Rutgers and he's on the job market this fall. So here's the plan of the talk. So we'll begin by reviewing some things in supersymmetric quantum mechanics, and in particular, stressing the relation to homological algebra. So we go back to Witten's paper from 1982 that established a relationship between super quantum mechanics and Morse theory. And in, in formulating the theory, you choose a Ramanian manifold M and a real valued function on M, which in physics is the superpotential, and we'll choose M to have non-degenerate isolated critical points. So H in mathematics is called a Morse function. And so we're studying the quantum mechanics of a particle moving around on M. So we have a map from the real line of time to M. And the Lagrangian, or at least the bosonic part of the Lagrangian looks like this. So a parenthetical remark is that, notice that only the one form alpha, which is dH appears here. And indeed for the action to make sense, the one form need not be exact. And that's the starting point for a lot of the work I'm doing with Asan. I'll return to that briefly later. Any, in any case, the, uh, the classical vacua are the zeros of alpha or the uh, stationary points of H. So for example, if we choose this deformed sphere here and let H be the height function, then the red points are the st stationary points and associated with each of these uh, critical points is a perturbative approximation to the ground state. I'll call it psi of P. And you can calculate the fermion number of this perturbative approximation in terms of the number of independent ways of going up or down from that the critical point. Now, the perturbative vacua are not the exact vacua because of instanton effects. So the instanton equation is the gradient flow equation, uh, which I've written here. And we can use the instantons to define an operator Q on the, the space spanned by the perturbative ground states. So the way you define Q is you say Q on a ground state associated with a, a critical point P is the sum over all of the ground states associated with Q, which have one fermion number higher. And then you weight that counting the number of instantons that flow from P to Q. And then in Morse theory, there's a, a, a standard result that says that if you look at um, the moduli space of instantons where the fermion number changes by two, uh, you look at the boundaries of that and they have to sum up to zero. And uh, that gives you this quadratic relation on the instanton number counts. And this is a a theme in the subject that if you have interesting instanton counting functions, then they satisfy nonlinear identities like this. 
In any case, because of this identity, Q squared to, is zero. And that means that you can talk about the cohomology and the claim is that the space of exact ground states, uh, the space of BPS states, if you like, is uh, the cohomology of this Q, uh, which is a little surprising because it's basically saying that you can get the exact ground states from one instanton effects. Now, what we're gonna do here is we're going to use some natural questions from supersymmetric quantum mechanics to motivate some standard constructions in homological algebra. And this is, this is pretty lame, but what I did is I, I chose the scariest font I could find in PowerPoint. And I was trying to find a scary font because when I start talking about homological algebra, um, many of my phys physics colleagues react like that and then subsequently like that. And so I'm just gonna encourage you to stick with it a little bit. So the first definition in homological algebra is the definition of a chain complex. So it's a triple of a vector space and two operators, F and Q. So F and Q are operators on this vector space V and F is diagonalizable with its spectrum, which is, sits inside the integers or more generally inside a Z torsor. And, F, and Q changes the F quantum number by one and Q squared is to zero. So in mathematics, that's called a differential. So that's exactly what we're getting from supersymmetric quantum mechanics. V is the span of the approximate ground states. F is the fermion number operator. Q is the supersymmetry operator. And in this case, I'll call it the MSW for Morse, Smale, and Witten, the MSW complex. The Morse smale witten complex depends on the manifold M, on the Ramanian metric, and on the Morse function H. As I said before, the exact ground states is the cohomology of this complex. And then in mathematics, it's a theorem in Morse theory that that commutes, computes the Durham cohomology. Uh, actually, you can do all this over the integers because with this natural uh, space of perturbative ground states, this natural basis of perturbative ground states, the uh, Q operator has integer uh, matrix elements. Everything can be done integrally. And then you would calculate the full singular cohomology of M. Uh, so that's an interesting little disconnect between math uh, and, and quantum mechanics that I've never really understood. But that's not where we're going today. Uh, what I want to do now is consider families of supersymmetric quantum mechanics. So homotopies of the metric and the superpotential. So we consider a continuous family of metric and superpotential H that depends on a control parameter S continuously. And so we ask, how does the MSW complex change from the beginning to the end of the family? And what we do is we define an operator, curly U, from the MSW complex at S1 to the one at S2. And the way you define it is you look at this uh, gradient flow equation now in the control parameter, and you say U on a perturbative ground state for the initial complex at point P is a sum over all the perturbative ground states at Q for the final complex where the fermion number is the same. And again, you weight that by counting the number of solutions to these uh, instanton equations. Now, by definition, U commutes with the fermion number, and then more non-trivially, but you can prove this, you commutes with the differential. So that leads us to the definition of a chain map. So a linear map between chain complexes, a C1 and C2, is called a chain map. If it's a linear map from V1 to V2 that commutes with the F operator and commutes with the differential. And so what we just learned is that under continuous deformation of metric and superpotential, the MSW complex changes by a chain map. Now, actually, it's a very special kind of chain map. It's what's called a homotopy equivalence of chain complexes. So to explain what that means, let's look at homotopies of paths, paths of paths. So we're now looking at a continuous map from the, the square with coordinates S and U into the space of metrics and Morse functions. So we have our metric gij is a function of s and u and h is a continuous function of s and u and we choose boundary conditions so that at s equals zero um, it's uh, it's independent of u and similarly at one 
And so therefore at u equals zero, we get a chain complex, sorry, get a chain map between the initial and final chain complexes. And at u equals one, we also get a chain map between the initial and final complexes. And then you can prove that the difference of u zero and u one is q exact in the sense of this equation. Where you can, you can actually construct E explicitly. So again, you look at solutions of this gradient flow equation, and then E maps a, a, an approximate ground state for a uh, critical point in the initial chain complex to the sum over critical points for the final chain complex with fermion number one lower. And again, you count the numbers of instantons suitably. And again, it's, it's, it's not trivial, but you can prove it by studying the behavior of these uh, solutions of these gradient flow equations, you can prove that u0 minus u1 is q exact in the sense of this equation. Okay, that leads to the mathematical notion of homotopies of chain maps. So we say in general, two chain maps F0 and F1 are homotopic if there's a fermion number minus one operator uh, that takes such that D F0 minus F1 is q exact. Now, if there are chain maps going both ways, so that F composed with G is homotopic to the identity and uh, G composed with F is homotopic to the identity, then we say that the chain complexes are homotopy equivalent. So in supersymmetric quantum mechanics, you can run S backwards and then that proves that U is a homotopy equivalence. Now in general, a chain map between complexes induces a map F hat on the cohomology. And if F is a homotopy equivalence, then F hat is an isomorphism. And that way we give a physics proof that H star of M is a homotopy invariant. Okay, so uh, I can take questions if there are any, but uh, otherwise let's move on to Lando Ginsberg models. I have a question. Yes. Um, those MPQs, as you had written down in the uh, in the definition of uh, of those operators, are yeah. all the uh, are all of them the same, or they depend on the parameters S and uh, S and U in the process? Uh, no, that uh, no, no, they're the, they're the number of of solutions. Uh, you you have a moduli space of these instant of these um, solutions to this gradient flow equation, and right. technically you're looking at at um, the so-called rigid instantons, the ones which only have a uh, translation symmetry, and if there is a translation symmetry, in this case there isn't, and you're literally just counting with signs the solutions of this equation. Right. So, so what no, there's no S dependence. No. So MPQ are all the same in the because in the on the first page you also have MPQ. That's also oh, no no I see what you're asking. No no yeah. no no these are di yeah thank you. Now I understand the question. So uh, no in the three I gave you three um, contexts in which there was an MPQ, and it, I was just being lazy. Uh, I I should have used a different letter, because after okay. all I'm I'm thinking about totally different flows. And defining the differential, I'm talking about flows which change the fermion number by plus one. And uh -huh. defining the chain map, I'm talking about flows where the, um, the fermion number doesn't change. And in, in, in writing the, uh, the homotopy, uh, I was talking about fermion number decreasing by one. So those are definitely totally different instanton moduli spaces. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's move on then to landau Ginsberg models. Um, so the data of a landau Ginsberg model is X is a Kähler manifold and W is a holomorphic function on X and we'll assume it to be Morse, namely that it has isolated non-degenerate critical points. So now what we wanna do is we wanna consider Morse theory on this infinite dimensional space curly X of maps from a one dimensional domain D into X and what we choose for our one dimensional domain depends on what physics we're discussing. So if we're talking about solitons, then D is the real line. If we're talking about brains, then D is the half line, either left or right half line. If we talk about the analog of open strings, and this is a massive uh, uh, field theory, but if we wanna talk about the analog of open strings, then D is the interval. And if you wanna talk about um, 
about local operators, bulk operators, I'll call them, or closed string states, if you like, then D is the circle. So that's, that's the space that we're going to do Morse theory on. And now what's the Morse function? For simplicity, let me uh, temporarily assume that the symplectic form is exact. So omega is D of a one form, a Louisville form, lambda. And so then the Morse function is the integral of the pullback of lambda over this spatial domain plus another one form, uh, real of zeta inverse W uh, dx, where I've introduced here a phase, zeta. Zeta is a phase, and it will play an important role later in the talk. So now it's a fun exercise to compute the supersymmetric quantum mechanics action for this curly x in this Morse function, and you get up to a total derivative term, exactly the standard landau ginzburg action for uh, capital Roman X and W. So there are three remarks to make. If this domain D uh, extends to infinity, then we need to choose suitable boundary conditions so that H, or at least the variation of H, is well-defined. And uh, we should choose it to be a classical vacuum. So the classical vacua are the critical points of W, and I'll denote those by phi sub I. And the, cross, the, the critical values, the values of W at the critical points are W sub I. The next remark is that, as in the case of super quantum mechanics I mentioned before, only the variation of H, or better, the one form delta H, is what enters into the computation of the action. So I didn't really need to assume that the symplectic form was exact. And similarly, uh, the one form alpha, which is the exterior derivative of W, doesn't really need to be exact. So W could be multi-valued, but as long as alpha is single-valued. And again, that's, that's the starting point for a lot of the stuff I was doing with Hassan. Uh, finally, the, nothing prevents me from letting W phi actually to depend explicitly on X. And then what we're talking about is a theory of supersymmetric interfaces from the initial X value to the final X value. And um, we'll see an explicit example of that later. Okay, so what are the stationary points? So we, here we have our Morse function. So what are the stationary points and the flows for this case? Well, the stationary points, delta H equals zero, is the same thing as solutions of what I'll call the zeta soliton equation. And the gradient flows for this H is this equation here, which is a deformation of the cauchy riemann equation, which I'll call the zeta instanton equation. So now let's first talk about the MSW complex for the landau ginzburg model where D is the real line. So in the real line, we have to choose boundary okay. conditions phi i and phi j at, plus and, at minus and plus infinity. And then okay. the MSW complex, I'll denote rij. So as a vector space, it's the span of the approximate ground states associated by semi-classical approximation around each of the different ij type solitons. You can label those by p. And uh, uh, and then the fermion number you can compute is given in terms of an eta invariant of a suitable Dirac operator. And as we know, QIJ is obtained by counting zeta instantons. So we have a, we have a complex, so we can take its Euler character, and that's the famous BPS numbers mu IJ, and uh, that's the BPS index. Now there's an important remark to make here about the MSW complex. So we, we're trying to solve the zeta soliton equation on the real line with boundary conditions phi i and phi j. Well, you can multiply that equation by dw d phi, and use the chain rule, and you see that if you evaluate w on a solution of the zeta soliton equation, then in the w plane, the solution evolves along a straight line in the w plane with phase i zeta. So if in the w plane you're evolving from x equals minus infinity, you have a straight line like this. And if you involve towards the right to plus infinity, then it has to end like that. So you have that picture. And now, of course, we want these two to meet. And so the solution can only exist when zeta is a very special phase. I'll call it zeta j i which is related to the critical values. It's basically the uh, phase of the difference of the critical values. And uh, as the old song says, 
you must remember this later on in the talk. Okay, so now following what we did with super quantum mechanics, let's look at families of Lando Ginsberg models. So now we have a family of Kähler metrics and uh, Morse superpotentials, depending continuously on S. And a very surprising fact is that uh, these Euler characters turn out to be not constant, but only piecewise constant. And that goes back to the paper of Chikati, Fendley, and Trilligator, and Vafa in 1991, and then was studied uh, more, more further by, by Chikati and Vafa in the early 90s. So notice this is very different from the finite dimensional situation. So not only the Betty numbers are not constant, even the, the, uh, the oil character is not constant. Now the chikati vafa wall crossing formula tells us how the mu ij's will jump. And now the subject of this talk is the categorified chikati vafa wall crossing formula, which seeks to describe how the homotopy equivalence class of these complexes rij jumps. So let me make a few remarks about that. So in stating that problem, I'm implicitly claiming that the homotopy equivalence class is a phys physically well-defined quantity, so that this is even a well-posed question. And moreover, that it's an interesting question in that the homotopy equivalence class of Rij is a non-trivial refinement of mu Ij. I'll try and give you an example of that at the end of the talk. Now it's often said that we can only hope to compute exactly an interacting non-integrable quantum field theory is the only thing we can hope to compute are Witten indices. And indeed, these lando gitzwerk models are interacting and non-integrable. And the rationale for this is that without supersymmetric cancellations, one should not expect to compute anything exactly in non-perturbative situations. So what we're doing here has some tension with standard folklore, although I would not say there's any contradiction. Now, finally, uh, one solution to giving a categorified wall crossing formula is in my old work with, uh, with the Gaiato and Witten. And the idea there was to consider families of landau ginsberg models as defining interfaces between initial and final models. And what we did was we constructed a flat parallel transport operator on brain categories. And we showed how that leads to a categorical version of excuse me, of braid relations. So the new thing for today is another way of presenting a categorification of the chikati vafa wall crossing formula. Okay, that bling, brings me to uh, thimble brains and their local operators. Are there any questions? Uh, Greg, I forget if I asked you this before. Uh, this is Arnoff. But in, in Morse theory, there's more that you can do rather than just get a homotopy equivalence class of the chain complex, MSW complex, calculating the Morse indices. You can recover the full homotopy type of the manifold that you started with, given the information of the Morse function and the yeah, entire category. Yeah, forms. yeah, 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 right. It gives so, you a natural cellular decomposition. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. So do you have an analogous story for the homotopy type of your script X here and how that jumps? Well, we are talking, we are gonna talk about the homotopy equivalence class of the RIJs. Yeah, but that, this, this is better. This is analogous to building the homotopy type of the manifold. Yeah, okay, you want something a like a CW complex. complex. Yeah, I've thought about this a little bit and I don't have a good answer. Um, You're right, in particular, not just a CW complex, but how it jumps. I would love to see how a CW yeah, complex jumps. Um, yeah, I got it. Um, right, so, um, so I think what you're asking is, can we somehow define a homotopy type of this uh, space of maps right. and give a cellular decomposition using the flows of this Morse function? Yeah, I, I kind of assumed you probably had already done that in Gaia. No, nope. well, <laughs> maybe implicitly, but <laughs> uh, if we did, I don't know that. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> sure. Well, anyway, that's the first question. And then second, what happens when you change? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wish I could answer that. I, I've, I've thought about that, but uh, I don't know the, the answer to that. Okay, sure, thanks. All right. But uh, may I ask you, uh, you know, maybe it's kind of uh, too early to ask, but still, uh, you know, in quantum mechanic, you know, when you, are, uh, you know, kind of changes the number of, say, ground state, right? Uh, uh, 
this uh, wall closing when you have this wall closing then you can uh, try uh, to ask yourself what happened with, the, with those wave function i mean which disappeared for example right i mean uh, what kind of uh, <laughs> illustrative understanding was, was going on with that because it could not be just uh, you know uh, it, i mean it, it is uh, yeah 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 okay i got it arkady well, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Uh, so that's, that, yes, I, I, I am very sympathetic to that. You know, where do those vacuum go? So um, what, what happens is they become, you know, we interpret them as bound states and then they either, uh, the bound states either uh, uh, um, fall apart in some way or yeah. uh, bound states come together. And that's, that's the kind of thing that we're trying to understand better when I say we want to understand this homotopy equivalence class of these rijs and that's more information than just the indices so the spirit of your question is very much in line with the uh main theme of this talk okay so uh so well you'll see the example at the end okay okay thanks. all right so let's let's move on so um so so um as with the old work with uh Giotto and witten the what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the brains and think in particular about, well, you could think of it as the category of brains or as an algebra of brains. Those points of view are equivalent uh, for what we're gonna do today. And the main idea, the main physical axiom, if you like, or working hypothesis is that the homotopy class of this algebra or category of brains should not change under homotopies of Landau Ginsberg models. That is the homotopy class of the category of brains should be invariant. So, okay, so we're talking about brains. So we're working on a half space. So we have a domain and infinity. So we're gonna take phi to approach one of these classical vacuous phi i at infinity. We, know we need a boundary condition. There are many supersymmetric boundary conditions, but for this talk, it will suffice to think about the very simple ones called Lefschetz symbols. So most of you know this, but maybe not everybody. So I'm gonna go over what Lefschetz symbols are. So, so consider one way of introducing it is to think, well, okay, suppose we want to solve the classical equation of motion with these boundary conditions that phi of x goes to phi i as x goes to infinity. So the classical equation of motion is the zeta soliton equation. So we ask, what are the possible boundary conditions on phi so that a solution exists? Now you can think of the zeta soliton equation as the gradient flow for the imaginary part of zeta inverse w. And so not, there's a basin of attraction. Not every, not every phi is gonna to flow to phi i. So there's a subspace in X, and that's the definition of the right left shed symbol of type i for phase zeta. It's right, not left, because X is going to plus infinity to the right, not minus infinity to the left. Okay, it turns out that these left shed symbols are Lagrangian subspaces, and they provide very nice half supersymmetric boundary conditions and those for those who are keeping score, uh, the supersymmetry that's preserved is this one, Q minus minus zeta inverse Q bar plus. And by no means are these the only supersymmetric boundary conditions, but they will suffice for today. Let me give you an example. Here's the simplest super potential you can write other than zero. Um, so now the, the zeta soliton equation looks like this, and it's the work of a moment to find the general solution of this equation. So it's an exponential in x, e to the plus or minus x. And uh, the phase of the solution is determined by zeta with the square root. And then we can multiply this by any, any real number. So there are two branches of solutions with the minus sign, that's the right left shed symbol. So that goes to zero, the critical point is zero. So that goes to zero as x goes to plus infinity to the right. With the plus sign, it's, uh, the left left shed symbol that goes to zero as x goes to minus infinity. And so now you plot these in the phi plane and you get these two Lagrangian subspaces. Because C naught you see can be any real number. So it maps out a line like this. Uh, here's, a, here's a slightly less trivial example. If we take W to be uh, this, when the critical points of the fourth roots of unity, take zeta as one and you can map out the uh, left shed symbols and they look like these golden uh, curves here. So now what we want to do is we want to take these boundary conditions and consider the boundary condition changing local operators between boundary conditions of type i and j. 
and let's call the vector space of these local boundary condition changing operators r hat ij. So don't confuse r hat ij with r ij. The distinction is very important. So I'll, I'll denote a typical uh, boundary condition changing operator by a green square like this. And the first thing to note is that this r hat ij is a chain complex. But it's so much more than just a chain complex. It's, uh, if we put all the r hat ij's together, it's an algebra. Why is that? Because we're working super symmetrically, so we can take an operator product and the lowest term in the operator product, so we can collide these operators and get a new operator. And so that defines a map I'll call row two from r hat ij tensor r hat jk to r hat ik. And actually, there are higher OPEs. We can take a collection of n such boundary operators and sort of simultaneously crunch them together. That defines an n-ary operation, rho n. And indeed, we can consider n equals one to be one of them. That would be the supersymmetry operator or the differential. Now, you could construct these, uh, these products using uh, something called the web formalism, which I worked out with Gaiato and Witten. And it involves pictures like this. And you might find this picture a little mystifying. And I'll try and demystify it a little bit later in the talk. And when you calculate this row two, well, it's only associative up to Q exact terms and the failure of associativity is governed by row three. And this is very similar to structures that are familiar from topological string theory. Indeed, R hat is what's known as an A infinity algebra, which means the following. So we again consider this uh, successive chain of N boundary operators and supposing we take a a successive chain of just k boundary operators, as indicated here, and we first collapse those with rho k, and then we collapse all the rest with rho n minus k plus one. So there are different ways of choosing uh, k successive boundary operators, and then of course I could vary k. And so if we sum over all of those possibilities with suitable signs, then the answer is zero, and those are called the A infinity relations. And in particular, when n is one, the only thing I can do is square row one, and that's why row one is a, uh, is a differential. That's the differential on the chain complex. Now, just as with chain complexes that I showed you before, there's a notion of homotopy equivalence of A infinity algebras, and it just extends the notion of homotopy equivalence of chain complexes, and it says that the OPEs are related to each other in ways that we don't need to go into. Some people will prefer to think of R hat as a category. Uh, so then the objects are the right left hat symbols and the hump spaces between two of these objects are these boundary uh, spaces of boundary changing operators R hat. If the real part of Wij is positive, of course, if I equals J, it's just Z or C depending what, what you're working over. And um, if R, the real part of Wij is less than zero, it's, it's zero. So we have a kind of upper triangular structure here. So whether you think of this as a category or an algebra, we're gonna call this thing R hat, and it depends on all this data on X, the Kähler metric, the superpotential, and the phase zeta. So again, categorical wall crossing says that if we have a homotopy of this data, then the associated R hats are homotopy equivalent. So now the remainder of this talk is going to show how this implies a concrete formula for how the soliton spaces Rij change. So the first thing to understand is that R hat Ij can be expressed in terms of these MSW complexes for BPS solitons. And so what you do is you imitate strength theory. So in step one, you imitate the strength theory and you consider the Landau-Ginsberg model in this kind of geometry where you have an infinite, semi-infinite strip, which is glued to the half plane, and you could take the strip size to zero to get a local operator. So you have a connection between local operators and states on the, on the interval. And then just as in string theory, you use a conformal transformation to map the half plane to the strip. Now our theory is not conformal, but if you do this transformation, then the Morse function changes in a very simple way. So it's just this Morse function. The only difference is this phase e to the i pi x on the interval it comes in. So the stationary points of this h are again the zeta soliton equation. The only difference is that zeta 
now has become X dependent. So now what can we say about solutions of this zeta soliton equation, this X dependent zeta soliton equation on the interval with say boundary conditions Li and Lk? So the idea is that we're gonna try to make solutions by inserting solitons from the case of the real line. And now I remind you that if we didn't have X dependence and we were working on, this, on the real line, then the zeta soliton equation only had solutions uh, phi ij sol solitons when zeta was the special phase zeta ij. Remember that was this picture and that's what Sam told you you had to remember. So I hope you remembered. Okay, so now that leads to the notion of binding points. So as X sweeps across the interval, the phase of, of this phase, zeta e to the minus i pi X sweeps across a half plane. Now when X is a special value, Xij, such that zeta e to the minus i pi Xij is zeta ij, we can insert an ij soliton. So we have a solution that looks like this to good approximation and then we can find the exact solution that, uh, to which this is an approximation. Now, once you realize that, then you say, oh, well, it should be possible to insert two solitons of type ij and jk like that, provided these phases, zeta ij and zeta jk, are clockwise ordered in that half plane that's swept out by zeta e to the minus i pi x. So those phases have to be clockwise ordered because we first go to xij and then to xjk and so on. So the net result is that we get solutions for whenever we have collections of central charges, z, i, i1, i1, i2, and so on, whose phases are clockwise ordered in a half plane. And again, for those who are keeping score, the, relation, the exact relation of these central charges, zij to the critical values is this, zij is zi minus zj, the zi is zeta times actually the complex conjugate of the uh, critical value. So in any case, we get r hat ik is rik plus rij tensor rjk, provided we have that clockwise ordering and so on. And we can associate pictures to the sum ends. So for rik, we associate this picture. For rij tensor rjk, we associate this picture where this line, this ij line is parallel to zij. Okay, and so on. So now, you can summarize uh, what I've just said in a very elegant formula, the product formula, which says the following. Let's, let's take these r hat ij's. There is a question in the chat. Oh, there's a question in the chat, yes. Why can't you just define a new variable t? Maybe you should just look at the chat. There's a formula. Uh, not so easy for me to look at the chat. Okay, why can't you uh, define a new variable t, which is i e to the minus i pi x over pi? Um, let me think about this. Why can't you define? Uh, well, you could, the answer is you could, but I'm not sure it would be helpful. I mean, I'm trying to present. Uh, it gets rid of the e to the minus i pi x. Uh, uh, well, yes, but I mean, what you're, doing, what you're doing is you're undoing the conformal transformation. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but then, then you'll have to then you'll have to solve the equation in that other domain. So, um, I mean, yes, you could do that. I I don't think it would be helpful. I tried to present this in the way I found most easy to understand. It's probably will put it at the edge of interval, right? I mean, yes, 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 yes. I'm trying to talk about solutions on this interval, and I'm trying to convince you that R hat. Ij, r hat ik, is the um, is going to be the complex that we make out of solutions on this interval, and I'm trying to explain to you that the r hat iks are related to the soliton spaces on the real line through this equation here, which I'm about to summarize in a very elegant way. Yeah, so you can say that it is like uh, gluing up different solutions, right? I mean, uh, one to, uh, to another. In uh, yes, you can. That's exactly what this, uh, that's exactly what this picture is uh, meant to convey. 
little orange balls are meant to be uh, little solitons from the real line. I guess I'm taking it as obvious, I think this is well known in soliton theory that you know you have a length scale set by the superpotential and then the solution is exponentially close to vacuum everywhere except in a tiny little blip, tiny little interval where the solution is jumping from one vacuum to another. So these pictures are meant to be at, at long distance compared to the length scale of the uh, set by the superpotential. Maybe that helps. Okay. So um, okay. So now this relation on uh, between the soliton spaces on the real line and this r hat i k is is elegantly summarized as follows. So let's let's make a matrix of complexes. So the eij here is the elementary matrix with a one and the i row and the j column. And the matrix element is a complex r hat i j. And then what I've said on the previous slides can be summarized by this equality here. It's equal to a product over elementary matrices, which is phase ordered by, ordered by the phases of the central charges. And therefore this thing is, because we're only uh, taking the product over a half plane, this is upper triangular. And so if you expand out the product on the right hand side, you're gonna find exactly what I was describing before. This is very similar to the phase ordered products in the matrix that Chikati and Vafa called S, which they claimed would calculate the UNR charges of the UV theory. And it's also the kind of thing that appears in the formula of Kantsevich and Soibelman. I won't be able to go into why that's true, but it's not an accident. There's a question in the another question in the chat. Okay. Aren't we breaking through the completely while gluing two solutions? Sorry, can you read it to me, Ibu? Aren't we breaking through the completely while gluing two solutions? No, we are not. We're finding solutions of the, no, absolutely not. So we're, we're talking, we are preserving the supersymmetry with the boundary conditions and the solution, the, the fact that we're solving that zeta soliton equation is the fact that we are um, preserving supersymmetry. All right, so, okay, so, um, so now what I wanna talk about is the, hold that thought by the way, because, because you're gonna be seeing that again in just a moment when I talk about the, uh, about the differential on r hat i k. So again, r hat i k lives, is related to the soliton spaces this way. And now you can ask, well, okay, what's the differential on the complex r hat i k? And now a mathematician would say, well, would probably say uh, that, well, okay, the Rij's, these are our complexes. So I could just take, you know, the differential on the Rik and the Rij and so on, and just use that differential. But that turns out to be physically the wrong differential. And so you could ask what went wrong? And the point is that you've missed important instanton effects if you do that. So now I wanna explain that. So. First of all, how do we calculate, let's go back to how do we calculate QIJ on RIJ? Well, we have a soliton in the past and another soliton in the future with fermion number one higher. And we're trying to solve the zeta instanton equation. And if we do solve it, then again, on a length scale large compared to the length scale set by the superpotential, all the variation of the field will be in some region that looks like this and everywhere else, the field is exponentially close to vacuum. So now let's, let's look at a similar problem where we have an initial and final soliton are the same soliton and we try and solve the, say, the zeta instanton equation. Well, there's an obvious solution. We just take phi of x and tau to be phi ij of x because I have the same initial and final soliton. And that certainly solves the equation. So we'll have a, a variation that lives in a region like that. And we get a domain wall between vacua phi i and phi j. And as I've explained to you several times now, that only exists when zeta is the special phase zeta ij. Now in calculating the differential on r hat ik, we want to solve the zeta Sol zeta instanton equation, not the zeta ij instanton equation. So what do we do about that? Well, what we do is we observe that if we rotate x plus i tau by a phase, then the cauchy riemann operator rotates by e to the minus i theta, which means zeta rotates by e to the plus i theta. 
okay? So that means that if we insist on solving the zeta instanton equation, we can just rotate the solution from the previous slide and make it look like that. This is a zeta instanton, not a zeta ij instanton, and the price we pay is we needed to rotate our domain wall. So I'm gonna call this the boosted ij soliton, and the slope of this domain wall is basically set by the slope of the uh, central charge, zij. And that leads to the idea of domain wall junctions. So now if our phases, if our central charges are clockwise ordered, then we can consider boundary conditions on the zeta instanton equation that look like this. So out at infinity, we first have a boosted ij, phi ij of x soliton, and then exponentially to exponential accuracy, we are in the vacuum phi j. And then we have the boosted phi j k of x soliton, and then we're in the vacuum phi k, and then finally phi k i of x soliton. And solutions to this, uh, to the zeta instanton equation with such boundary conditions actually are, are, do exist. They are studied in the literature, in the literature on domain wall junctions, or even exact solutions to these. So we get new solutions to the zeta instanton equation, and they give contributions, instanton contributions to the differential on r hat ik. So remember, r hat ik is the direct sum of r ik and r ij tensor r j k, and so it's, it's kind of an off-diagonal matrix element contribution to the differential that takes r ik to r ij tensor r j k. And this instanton is part of what goes into this web formalism that I alluded to. Okay, indeed, taking account of these instantons leads to something we call interior amplitudes. So if I have a, a set of vacua um, such that the, the central charges, zij, zjk, zki are, are clockwise ordered, I'll call that a cyclic fan of vacua. And if I choose solitons, I'll call that a cyclic fan of solitons. So now you look at the moduli space of solutions to the zeta instanton equation with these fan boundary conditions, call it MF, and it can have compact and connected components. And then the signed sum over those components gives numbers I'll call beta F. And you could turn that into a vector in a vector space by, um, for every cyclic uh, fan of, of vacua, I take the corresponding cyclic tensor product of the soliton spaces, call that R sub F. So we multiply beta sub F by the uh, tensor product of those solitons and we get a vector in the space. And it turns out that this beta satisfies nonlinear equations known as the Mori Carton equation for an L infinity algebra. So this is a generalization of what we saw at the very beginning of the talk, where those instanton numbers satisfied some interesting nonlinear uh, identities. Okay, I'm finally ready to talk about wall crossing, and I've only got 13 minutes to do it. So uh, maybe I'll defer questions to the end of the talk so I can get to the main point. So here's the standard, uh, here's the standard wall crossing situation. So we have a family of superpotentials. Uh, think of it as the left and the right of the screen, and there's a marginal stability wall, which is the vertical dotted, uh, vertical dashed line. Okay, and so as the superpotential varies from the left to the right, the central charges Zij, Zk, Zjk, and Zik, they, they change, the Zij is rotating clockwise, the Zjk is rotating counterclockwise. On the dashed blue line, they're all lining up, and then the Zjk keeps, keeps rotating counterclockwise, the Zij keeps rotating, rotating clockwise, and so the, so the clockwise ordering of the central charges flips as we go across this dashed line. So that's the standard wall crossing scenario. In terms of the, uh, the um, critical values of the superpotential, what's happening is that Wj is moving through this line segment between Wi and Wk. So on the left side of the wall, what kind of cyclic vacua do we have? Well, we have an Ijk type cyclic vacua, uh, cyclic fan of vacua. And on the right side of the wall, the cyclic fan of vacua is of type Ikj. 
So now let's look at the r hat space. So on the left side of the wall, r hat i k is r i k plus r i j tensor r j k because we have a cyclic ordering of of um, central charges, a, a clockwise ordering of central charges, uh, i j and then j k. And there can also be zeta instantons of this type, these domain wall junctions, and they modify the supersymmetry operator. On the right side of the wall, there's no way of modifying r hat i k. So r hat i k is just r i k because the suitable clockwise ordering of vacua doesn't exist. And so q a hat i k is uncorrected. But there's a new multiplication operation. Uh, a new multiplication, the zeta instanton of type i k j modifies the uh, multiplication of r hat i j tensor r hat j k to r hat i k. So different things are happening on different sides of the wall. So I remind you about the statement of categorical wall crossing. If we make a homotopy of the Landau-Ginsburg data, then the r hat algebras or categories are homotopy equivalent. So now we have the tools to say how the r i j complexes change, at least up to homotopy equivalents. So the definition that we need from homological algebra is the notion of a cone. So in general, if F is a chain map between two chain complexes, then we can construct a new chain complex called the cone of F. And it's morally the difference of V2 minus V1. These are vector spaces. So I said I should take V2 direct sum V1 uh, shifted by minus one. That means I've shifted the fermion numbers by minus one. And the differential on the cone is, well, the naive differential is the diagonal matrix, Q2 minus Q1. But then we can put the chain map there in the off diagonal uh, position. And uh, that still gives us a differential because F is a chain map. because That's the cone of F. Now, in our wall crossing situation, the interior amplitude defines a chain map between Rik and Rij tensor Rjk, and it's basically obtained by inserting and contracting with this kind of instanton. On the right-hand side, we get a different chain map from Rij tensor Rjk to Rik. So we have two chain maps. So our main claim is that an elegant way of solving the wall crossing constraint is to say that the Rik soliton complex on the right is homotopy equivalent to the cone of this chain map on the left. And similarly, the chain map on the left is the cone of this chain map on the right. Conversely, if these, uh, if these A infinity categories or algebras of brains are homotopically equivalent, then we argue in our paper that up to homotopy, the R on the left and the right are related by cone constructions as above. Okay, so that's, that's our main claim. Now I wanna talk about some corollaries of this claim. Uh, so one is a, a quick derivation of the chikati waffle wall crossing formula. So the standard derivation goes like this. So you have this, this, this product formula. And now let's take the Euler character of this product formula. So that defines some new objects, mu hat ij, which are the BPS, or which are the, excuse me, the Euler characters of r hat ij. So by the product formula, they're related to the old mu ij's by this formula. And so now, now you argue that the mu hat ij's are invariant under wall crossing because the r hat ij's are um, homotopically equivalent. So on the left, we have this product. On the right, we have that product with the opposite order and the soliton numbers have changed from left to right. And it's well known that the equality of these, of these two matrices is, the, uh, uh, is equivalent to the chikati waffle wall crossing formula. Now you might, now in fact, this mu hat ij has a nice geometrical construction which makes it completely obvious that it's invariant under wall crossing. So you can show again, using the product formula that this, this mu hat ij is an intersection number of left shed symbols where you perturb one slightly uh, counterclockwise and the other slightly clockwise. So 
you know, on the two sides of the wall, the critical values look like this, and uh, the uh, you can't see it if I point with a laser pointer, but the uh, the WJ, which I should have labeled, sorry about that. The WJ on the left is moving through the line between WI and WK to the right. And that's the wall crossing. And it's completely obvious that these, these you hat intersection numbers are invariant. Okay, so that's the usual story. Uh, the wall crossing formula also follows directly from our cone formula because, okay, if you have this homotopy equivalence and that immediately by taking Euler characters implies the Chikati Waffle wall crossing formula. Okay, so I better conclude with an example. I've got a few minutes. So um, let's let X be the elliptic curve with modular parameter tau minus the origin and the superpotential is, uh, is the Weierstrass function. So then the critical points are the half periods. And one can show that the number of solitons for, our, for any tau is equal to two. Here's a picture. So I lifted this from the paper. Uh, and so the X1 and the X3, and those are the half period points. And you can see that there are two solitons between any pair of half period points. All right, so tau lives in the upper half plane and there's some kind of modular invariance of the whole story. So you, uh, a marginal stability wall is this, uh, this dashed line along the imaginary axis. And then we have all its modular transformations, but we don't need to do that. I want to look at a special point, tau equals two pi i over e to the two pi i over three, because then we have a very useful Z3 symmetry in the problem. And so we'll consider the wall crossing where we go from pi, tau equals e to the two pi i over three to tau equals i pi over three. So our soliton spaces, as I said, there are two solitons. So there are two kinds of bound states of type ij for each ij. You could calculate the Fermion number. It, it's a, something related to something called the Maslov index. You don't have to actually calculate an eta invariant, which is a good thing because those are not calculable. And now you need to figure out what is the interior amplitude. So that's a vector in the uh, cyclic product of um, R's. There's only one cyclic fan of vacuum, uh, one, two, two, three, three, one. So beta is a vector in here and then well, that's an eight dimensional space, but uh, using symmetry is associated with winding numbers and stuff like that. We, we argue, we don't really prove it, but we argue that it's very likely that beta is given by this simple formula here. It has an elegant interpretation. If you look at the image of the zeta instanton, then it fills one of the two triangles like that. Okay, so our cone formula says that R on the right is equal to the cone of R on the left given by the chain map from contracting with that chain complex. Of course, the dimension of the space on the left is six, but the index is minus two. And indeed, using this beta, you can calculate the cohomology with respect to this cone differential, and you find that it's generated by these kinds of bound states. So the BPS states have rearranged themselves as bound states of each other in this very explicit way. And that comes back to Arcadi's question, which I said I would answer. So now I'm trying to answer it. Um, we, we understand you know, in, in, some, in some finer detail exactly what is happening to the different vacua as we cross this wall. So this is an example of the kind of extra physical information that refines the knowledge of the mu ij. So it's time, <coughs> excuse me, it's time for me to conclude. So the motivation for this project actually was the desire to find a categorification of the four dimensional wall crossing formula. That's something I spent some time uh, working on a few years ago with Tudor Damofti and Davide Gaiato. Um, and it's, it's a very difficult problem. So we think that the next step towards four dimensions is to generalize the situation to include what are called twisted masses in the physics literature. And what that means in mathematics is just that this one form alpha, which is delta W and the symplectic form omega equals D lambda are closed, but not exact. And the reason that's the next step is that the wall crossing formula for these 2D systems with twisted masses is formally identical to certain non-trivial special cases of the 2D, 4D wall crossing formula. Uh, 
And it's clear what you have to do here. You have to just work equivariantly on a suitable cover x hat of x so that alpha and omega do become exact. But it turns out that work generalizing the web formalism to this equivariant context is, is non-trivial. And that's something I've been spending a lot of time working on with, uh, with Asan. All right, so stay tuned for Asan's seminar at the NHETC if you wanna hear this story presented in a different way. I'm not sure how much Asan will actually say about the twisted mass case, but um, that concludes my talk. Thank you. Okay, so this, these headphones are killing me. So I'm gonna take them off and use the mic instead. Are there any questions? I am uh, saying just to kind of, it's not really a question, but kind of analogy to what you were saying, because uh, I was kind of returning back to some a few years ago, uh, some number of years ago, when we considered this type of, uh, you know, wall closing in say uh, C plus one, right? Like, uh, you know, kind of marginal stability there. Uh, but. You know, I no, I I like this particular stuff about you know kind of bound state where it appears and disappears, right? And this marginal stability curve was the one you know where it's happened. What is different from say uh, Landau Gisbert model? It is that in uh, three plus one, you know, um, uh, this is existence or non-existence bound state. It's more related to the stuff like say Coulomb potential, right? Because you know how you can. Uh, change uh, stuff um, that, um, you know, when uh, bound state disappears or appears. And there it uh, shows in, in the form that on, on the marginal stability, you know, on the, on the wall closing, your uh, kind of, your effective uh, Coulomb potential is changing sign. You, uh, so bound state, uh, you know, could, could, could indeed it, it disappear or appear and, and it is very kind of, close to what you are saying, you know, in, in your example. Okay, I'm sorry that maybe it's a irrelevant comment, but still. Oh, no, me. I totally agree with that. That's, um, uh, that's I, I, I think that's a very nice picture of how the wall crossing is working physically in, um, in the four-dimensional case. And that can be generalized to something called the halo formalism to talk about multi-bound states, which is a very, very powerful picture. I, I actually did try and um, make a close analogy uh, to that picture uh, with Edward and Davida. Um, and we, we, you know, we tried to define a, a kind of bound state radius and explain how the bound state radius uh, mm -hmm. goes to infinity. I, I would say that's in an appendix in our paper. I think I would say it's only partially is successful. Actually, I think I'm missing that up. I th sorry, I think that's in a paper with, um, excuse me, that's wrong. Is it, I mean, the attribution is wrong. The physics is right, but the attribution is wrong. That's in a paper with Davide Gaiato and Andy Knightsky. It's in our paper on 2D, 4D systems. We, we tried to generalize exactly the picture you're talking about to, to the landau gitzberg situation. Okay, thank you. There's a question in the chat. Okay. If I understand correctly, the homotopy class of Rij is invariant in the D term variations. What about F term variations? The variation of the superpotential is an F term variation. I don't understand the question. I wasn't. I wasn't making uh, a distinction there. Yeah, for some reason I can't see the chat. I don't really understand why. I'm not going to try and figure out Zoom subtleties right now. So you, you can just tell me what's in the chat. Right. The response is right. Thanks. Uh, yeah. If you have more questions, just please unmute your mic. Go ahead. I guess I wasn't very clear. Okay. 
Well, you have another choice. You have another chance with, um, and choice indeed. You have another choice and chance with Asan. Okay. Um, if we'll stop the recording now, if anyone wished to ask questions after that or have a brief discussion.